Good morning and welcome to Starversations. I hope that you are well this morning. I have my coffee. Do you have yours or your tea or your smoothie or whatever it is that helps you get going in the morning? I'm coming on at 11 o'clock now because I figured eh, people need a time to, to sleep in and then I had time to get my workout on. All right, so have a sip. Nothing like a good cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> yes. So in case you don't know me, my name is Charlene Robinson. I am a mental health therapist. I have 12 years of mental health background from one-on-one -on -one group home, residential, you name it. <laughs> and of course, individual outpatient therapy, which is what I'm doing, culture therapy, back for it. So, I am also a certified pastoral counselor. I also specialize in substance abuse counseling as well as regular counseling. And here's the thing. Our people are not used to getting counseling. It's been such a stigma in our um, culture. And I'm here to try to erase that stigma. So, I'm bringing some topics and some of them are pretty serious. And if you didn't know, May is mental health month awareness awareness month and I don't know why it's just confined to one month because it's something that you have to pay attention to all year round your mental health matters so enjoy the music we need a healing for our soul our mind and our bodies especially we're gonna talk about that <laughs> Yes. All right. So we're going to be talking about low key suicide. And I put that topic out there. I actually had a graphic, and we're going to go over that graphic. I had this posted on my page uh, this week. And I just really want you to. Pay attention to what I'm saying because I know, you know, people are like, well, I don't have suicidal thoughts or anything. I don't have suicidal ideations. And wonderful. That's wonderful. Praise God. But we are, somewhat all of us, are participating in low-key suicide. And if we don't pay attention to what our bodies are telling us, it's going to be an issue. Okay. As you know, I'm always reading books and always doing research. That's just what I do. But I did find this one quote on Instagram, and someone had put it out there by Bob Marley. And as you, if those of you who are familiar with him and his music, he always had a message. It wasn't just music. It always had a message. So this one is, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Hmm. None but ourselves can free our minds. And our, our bodies and our health and our soul, our spirit, it's all about the mind. Whatever your mind, you make up your mind to do is what's going to happen. Okay? So when you realize your power, <laughs> nothing and no one can stop you. All right? All right. So, low-key suicide. What is she talking about? <laughs> all right. So, the book that I'm going to be um, referring some of my talk from is written by a black doctor. She's, her name is uh, Dr. Rita Walker, and it's called The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health. Um, this is one of the recommended books for all counselors. Um, and I think some people who are not counselors or in the helping profession should have this book. Um, it, the way she writes and the material she's writing, it's just straightforward, it's not real deep. You know, it's easy to understand. And uh, it, it, I found some good things in it. So we're going to talk about some of that. All right. So um, know this, first of all, dep depression is real. Suicide is real. Uh, black mental health is real. Always check up on those and get a real answer to the question, how are you doing? A lot of times, you know, we just say, oh, we're fine. And we keep it moving. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> if you're on my heart and I call you, there's a reason. I want, I'm either picking up something in my spirit or you just, I, you know, God just had you on my mind. 
something's going on. Um, and then sometimes, you know, people say, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Ask more than one time because it's urgent. People are going through and they've been going through for over a year. So we really have to pay attention. Listen up. I'm going to give you a warning now. I'm going to say some things that are true, but you may not be ready to hear. Okay? That's my disclaimer. <laughs> All right. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You know, I remember growing up, I heard a couple of people say, well, suicide is a cop out. I was like, "Ooh, that's rough. <laughs> that's harsh. It's like, wow. But suicide is serious and it is preventable. But here's the thing. It's in the mind. The battlefield is in the mind. All right. I've heard some people say um, that when someone says something about suicide, it's a cry for help or attention. Um, sometimes it is. But if somebody gets to that point where they're actually ready to commit suicide, it's more than attention. It is a cry for help. Um, maybe. Um, but you are going to wait until they get into a crisis situation before you do something about it? I don't think so. If someone tells me, you know, I'm just, this life is just, it's just too hard. I just don't want to be, I just want to stop the world. I just want to get off. Now, for me as a counselor, that makes my ears go up, my antennas go up. And I'm like, hmm, let me talk a little bit longer. And they may have just said it in passing. They might have been joking. It's not a joke. Um, when people say that out their mouth, they there's something going on. Now, they may not necessarily mean that they're going to have a plan or anything, but we'll get to that. Check this out. Women are roughly three times more likely than men to commit suicide. Yeah, that's a say lot moment. Your mental health matters. You're going to hear me say that a lot. All right, first of all, because people are experiencing the trauma of the pandemic, COVID-19, and systemic racism, those of us who are black and brown, we have to become aware of the signs, warnings, watches. For example, there's a difference between a hurricane warning, which means there's a severe storm coming, get your flashlight, get your food, your candles, okay, and a hurricane watch means the storm is possible, it may or it may not come, okay? Same with suicide. A person can give off vibes and there may be some risk factors involved as well. Now, a suicide watch, when people are placed on a suicide watch, when it's believed that they exhibit warning signs indicating that they may be at risk of actually committing bodily harm or self-injury. No, if somebody tells you, like I said, that they plan on killing, killing yourself first, get somebody to call 911 and do a wellness check. That's for, let them know. It's a mental health wellness check. That's all, okay? Because I think they sent out a whole different team. It's called the ACT team. And that's um, an active crisis team where it's a mental health worker, a social worker, EMS, and the police. The social worker and the mental health worker will go in first. If they need EMS or the police, they're right there, and then they go. They take care of it. That's how it's supposed to work. Anyway, um, and then calmly ask them, uh, well, do you have a plan? And they tell you, I have a bottle of pills, and I got a glass of water, or they have a, a pistol right by their side. Do not get off the phone with them. <laughs> This is why mental health counselors really have to have two phones. Because while you're talking to them, and if there's nobody else around that you can holler to call 911 and get them to this address, that's when you have to have that other phone available so you can make that phone call. All right. So if they're not giving you specifics, then you can probably just talk to them and suggest maybe you need to talk to somebody, like a counselor. All right. Let me go to the book because she um, describes three different types of counseling. I mean, uh, uh, mild risk scenarios in a uh, case of suicide. She talks about a mild risk, a moderate risk, and a severe risk. And I'm just going to read a couple of lines from each. All right. So um, here's a mild risk scenario. Your single 29-year-old brother recently lost his job 
and has been saying for a few days that he might be better off dead. He does not have a plan to die. Okay? But he tends to bounce back from adversity, and you know this. Okay? Acknowledge that he's going through a tough time. Remind him of his strengths and things that he does well. Check up on him. Make sure, see if anything changes. He's okay. All right? Now, a moderate risk scenario is this. Your married 39-year-old uh, sister has been in an emotionally abusive relationship with her husband for seven years. That's a long time. They do not have any children. At times, she feels hopeless about her future, whether or not she'll have children, um, and whether her career will end up being what she's hoping it to be. She has overdosed in what seemed to have been a suicide attempt less than five years ago. When you ask her if she's okay, she has been having thoughts of suicide, and she says uh, um, to stay out of her business. <laughs> a lot of folks will tell you, I'm good, just leave me alone. Mind your own business. Mm, you know people like that. Okay, acknowledge that what she's been going through is a tough time. Sometimes it can be hard. You don't know what to do. Ask her, if you were to have thoughts of suicide, would you tell me? Mm, that's a good question. Okay. And then pay attention to any new and unusual behavior as uh, sudden unexpected changes in behavior could suggest that she's in a crisis. And if she is, again, you want to call 911 and ask them to do a mental health wellness check. Now, severe risk scenario. Your 19-year-old niece went off to college and is home for winter break. The adjustment to college has been very difficult. She's a kind person, but she was always an anxious teenager who managed to get mostly A's in school. Her sophomore year of high school was rough, and she had some type of breakdown due to bullying. So there's a whole lot of pre-existing things going on. She ends up having some type of emotional breakdown. Of course, the family didn't talk about it. You know how we are. And she's been drinking pretty heavily. That's a coping skill. Not a healthy one, but it's a coping skill. She told her mother she wants to die. She does not see any reason to live. You see how severe it's getting? Um, your niece feels completely hopeless about her future. Um, she says she just wants to die. If she has a plan and the means to die, the situation is a crisis. Okay? Now, I'm going to put this number here, and I'm going to put it on my page after, after the talk. Um, consider calling the Suicide Prevention Hotline. And that's 800-273-8255. I'll say it again, 800-273-8255. That is a National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And there's somebody there. You're not going to be on hold. Okay? You do not want to ever minimize or be dismissive of suicide thoughts, ever. If someone has a life situation that they cannot manage and are feeling hopeless about the future, you want to pay attention. Even if you do not see the big deal, it's a big deal to them. That counts. Okay. I just wanted to bring that across. I like the way she wrote it. I said she wrote it better than I could say it. <laughs> so it's serious. All right, let's talk about the low key part. Mm-hmm. All right. Where are we? Okay. So, like I said, we're living in desperate and trying times. We have got to be our brothers and our sisters keeper. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians anyway. Checking up on somebody. You know, the Lord doesn't put someone on our mind for, for nothing. He means contact them. Especially if he keeps putting that same person on your mind. You haven't done it yet. You know how the Holy Spirit is. He'll keep reminding you. <laughs> okay. Like I said, you don't ever want to minimize if anyone says to you anything about suicide. All right, so chapter three of Dr. Bo um, Rita, uh, Rita's book, Rita Walker's book, is called Poor Diet, Neglected Health, Addiction, and Low-Key Suicide. Well, of course, that attracted my attention because I was like, wow, that's deep. <laughs> and what's low-key suicide? What is that? Well... So I read the chapter and made my usual notes in the margin like I do when I read any book. And I just gleaned some things from the chapter, which was really, really interesting. It's one thing to have a bad day every now and then. 
everybody has a bad day or a couple of bad days. It can get like that. Like that's life. But when it becomes like it turns into a week and then it's two weeks or more than that, it can evolve into depression where you're having overwhelming feelings. And if your decisions put you in a situation that could inadvertently lead to your premature death, there is underlying problem that needs to be addressed. Would you agree? Amen. Mm-hmm. All right. So, uh, Dr. Mia says, life-threatening problems such as chronic health issues, drug or alcohol abuse, even homicide. <laughs> okay, are worsened by the urge to resolve pain and suffering and trauma without addressing the core feelings or the root problems of the situation, okay? So, we're still talking about low-key suicide, so let's give you some examples. Um, suicide by neglecting your physical health, let's start there. Say what? Huh? Yeah, I, saw, I meant it. All right, here's a question. Do you have diabetes too, type two? Are you taking your insulin? Are you eating right? Are you exercising? Are you monitoring your blood sugar as required? Hmm. The odds are that you are not doing some of these. Suicide by neglecting your physical health. What about high blood pressure? Well, it runs in my family. Okay. Uh, but why? Hmm. Newsflash. High blood pressure also uh, with cholesterol. They're partners. And they're both not good for your heart. Are you taking your meds daily at the same time every day? Are you drinking three to four bottles of water? Like I'm talking about 16.9 ounces of water. That size bottle every day are you avoiding salt and fried foods are you exercising are you checking your blood pressure yes no maybe so again suicide by neglect of your physical health <laughs> yeah i'll put a pin there because i went to the doctor i have high blood pressure and she had extended the prescription for as long as she wanted she said no you need to come today i need to see you I was like, all right, I had a physical annual, you know, annual physical last July. I should be good. But I have, I don't know. I don't like going to doctors. I don't like to go unless I absolutely have to go. And I had to go. So, of course, I get the doctor anxiety. <laughs> I don't know why. I just do. So I get there and they take my blood pressure. It's 150 over 100. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's not normal for me. And I told her, well, I said, well, my normal is 139 over maybe 90. And she looked at me. She's like, that's not normal. Normal is 120 over 70. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I said, well, it wasn't high any other morning until this morning. And she's like, you took your medicine? I did. Hmm. Okay. So then she's like, are you exercising? I said, well, I was, but past couple of weeks I haven't been. And she said, um, what are you eating? I was like, well, <laughs> a little barbecue, fried chicken, you know. And she's like, mm-hmm. She said, let me explain to you something. <laughs> she said, high blood pressure means that your heart is working more than it should. And the heart is a muscle. So what happens, it causes it to pump harder, which creates muscle, and then you have a stroke. <laughs> and she just said it so manufacturally. I was like, okay. So, I have, she put me on some kind of calcium blocker, and I'm like, oh, great. Now I'm taking two medications. I'm like, listen, I am not the medication girl. I am not one who wants to take all these pills for, no, I'm not. Even for a regular headache, I won't even take anything unless I absolutely have to. So, I made a conscious decision in the mind, and like, you got to get back to working out. You got to get back to eating right. You got to do a detox. I just said, let's get, let's get it together. Okay. Um, of course, I need to reduce some of the stress in my life. And that'll come. <laughs> okay. But we have to pay attention because another book that I'm, I'm reading is called Your Body Keeps Score. 
Hello. <laughs> you may not keep score, but your body is. <laughs> so, when your body, and your body talks, that's basically, that's the first sentence he says. It's like your body talks. It's just whether we listen or not. Mm. Carry on. All right. So, do you know what a high functioning alcoholic looks like? Well, I'm going to tell you. Probably not. Let me describe what they look like. They have a great job, nice car, nice house. They've accomplished a lot. Uh, they seem like their marriage and their children relationship is going well. Mm -hmm. But they're getting drunk every day. And they're still going to work. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not alcohol. Maybe it's painkillers. After they've had a back injury, the doctor prescribed the, doc the medication for pain. Or for whatever reason, they think these pills are also supposed to kill every pain in their life. Hmm. Uh, like heartache, stress, or just because they feel bad. Well, the pain meds can't be that bad. The doctor prescribed them, right? When people say you never know what goes on behind closed doors true they could be talking about your life i'm just gonna have a coffee on that mm -hmm. anyway you may not want to intervene but know this you cannot make someone do something that they don't want to do or they're not ready to do even if you call them out it's like you know because i'm a <laughs> There was this one deacon, I won't name the church or nothing, but uh, used to come to church every Sunday morning and it was like, what's that smell? <laughs> and it's like, is he drunk? I thought I smelled alcohol on his breath. You know, so doing the hug of love, he's hugging everybody and I'm like, that's alcohol. I was like, wow, you gonna come to church like this? What's going on? But you never, ever know what people are dealing with. I had a friend who said that he used to put vodka in his water bottle and drink it all day and nobody knew. And he could still work. Okay. Until one time he went out to lunch, called himself taking a nap. And he went to sleep. He slept the whole rest of the afternoon. Almost lost his job. They sent him to rehab. Mm-hmm. All right, so the person who is that high functioning alcoholic or the one popping the pain pills is killing themselves slowly. You do know you can die from alcohol poisoning. And here's the thing, when you've been doing it for so long, okay, you literally have to be weaned off. You can't just quit cold turkey, not with alcohol. Okay. So that alcoholic, his kidney hasn't failed yet, but they will. Low-key suicide. I've heard so many people say, I can quit anytime. That's with smoking and drinking, same thing. I can quit anytime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to die for something. Mm -hmm. You're right. Well, that's what happened with my dad. My mom and, and dad both decided they were going to quit smoking together. Mom stuck with it. Dad did not. He used to, you know, sneak out in the back of the house and smoke. And I said, well, if you're going to sneak and smoke, you might as well just say you ain't quitting. And that's when it was, well, I'm going to die from something. Well, he did. And it was cancer. So, all right. Um, I know it's a rude awakening. And I understand denial is a defense mechanism it's a way of coping with situations that are just emotionally overwhelming, but you can't stay there. Ask for help. Ask. There's no shame in asking. Or you can say, I can help, but you can't begin to help if you don't know the problem. You know something is off about somebody, but you don't know the problem. You don't know what they're dealing with. That's the when you suggest and listen. You might need to talk to somebody. <laughs> talk to somebody. Okay? The root of addiction is uh, and neglect or whatever is usually because there's some unaddressed pain or trauma that has happened and it can lead to 
I don't give a damn anymore. Attitude. And then they wonder, well, is life really worth living? When people get to that point, like, you know, <laughs> okay. Know this, the problem is not the drugs or the alcohol or the pain pills. It's denial and suppression of the pain the person is trying to hide, trying to bury, trying to cover it. Just, just no, I don't even want to think about it. Okay, especially during this pandemic, people have lost people. They're still grieving and they don't even acknowledge that they're grieving. All right, let me read you something else that's in the book. Um, yeah, let me just read this little section right here. This is deep. You try journaling, spa time, shopping, and other means of escape and coping, but nothing seems to work. Life isn't getting any better. And you question why you are alive. Well, you're still here for a reason. Can I say that? All right. You have prayed and prayed and gone to church most Sundays. Well, now we're not, but we're online. Um, but boost your mood only lasts for a few hours after the service. Some days you wish life would just stop. We do not have to call it suicidal. If it will help you do things differently, we can call it something else. This condition where your psychological fortitude meter is on E, empty. And you have no desire to fill the tank. Wow. You have no energy to fight. You're only waiting for something to happen. Though you have no idea what that something is. And here's the thing. I know this isn't biblical and it's a little out there, but the law of attraction is real. You reap what you sow, you sow what you reap. Okay, we're going to keep going. All right. You want to live and be happy. So you must not be suicidal, right? I do not want to be the bearer of bad news. I also do not want to scare you. I've already said that people who died by suicide did not want to die. They were just like you. They did not want to carry on day in and day out in this kind of pain. You may have had some or all of these thoughts. You no longer see the point in living. Mm. Asking for help will not come to you easily if you are accustomed to doing everything on your own. Did I say that? Did she say that? Yes, and then. It is, however, something that you can get yourself out of uh, once you elevate your psychological fortitude. Put something in the tank. Well, how do you put something in the tank? Read your word, pray, go talk to somebody. Okay, because sometimes it's an unnecessary struggle. <laughs> I mean, you have to be able to look at your situation differently. Okay, um, you, you sometimes we're just stuck in our thinking, just stuck. Uh, you know, advancement in a career you despise when you don't get the respect you deserve and you're afraid to move on. What does the Bible say about fear? Okay. Unaffordable shoes, handbags, social events, pushing your credit and debt out of control to overcompensate your unhappiness. Oh, I know I stepped on some ladies' toes right there. Pursuit of compliments and admiration from others, though they don't even know the real you. For example, social media. In the end, you feel more isolated. Do you not? We're all we're so conditioned to go big or go home. <laughs> okay? But you have to do something, anything that is different from when you're usual. Okay. Let's go this to the handout. And I've talked about this so many times, self-care. Okay, so what can we do with all the pain and stress we have? We can do some self-care. And we can talk to somebody, a counselor, Find a support group. You got Narcot Narcotics Anonymous. You've got Alcohol Anonymous. You've got grief groups online, in person, however you want to do it. You can talk to a pastor. You can talk to a teacher. You can talk to somebody. Talk to somebody who doesn't know you. How about that? 
<laughs> All right. So here's some options for self-care. You can meditate, pray, get in your word, read, get more sleep. Now, if you're oversleeping and doing too much sleeping, then get up. <laughs> okay. Drink more water. Okay, whether you have high blood pressure or not, we're supposed to be drinking 64 ounces of water. Why? Because our bodies are made up of 60% or 70% fluid. And if we're sweating it out or eliminating it out, we got to replace it. Exercise. Got to. I don't care if you just walk around your house or walk around your complex. Do something. <laughs> Read some good books. I, you know, I'm always reading. I'm a reader. There's books all around me. <laughs> but upstairs, by the bed, everywhere. In the bathroom. <laughs> um, make a decision to be happy. Smile. Look in the mirror. Smile at yourself. Listen to some good music. Make a, um, a favorite playlist. I have a playlist on my phone for every mood. <laughs> Some of the names of my playlists are real funny. One is called Chillaxin. It's all instrumental, smooth jazz. I love it. You know, then I have one that's called Attitude. That's my angry music. Well, you know, my radical, that's the cussing and angry music. But, you know, <laughs> then I have Char's Groove. Hey, you know. Anyway, take a bath. Bubble bath. Light some candles. Relax. Breathe. <sighs> Okay, be mindful. Just just go outside, inhale, close your eyes, and just listen to the sounds of nature. I know it sounds crazy, but it feels good. Eat some healthy food. Eat something that you know is good for you. And this is a, the summer season coming up, spring and summer. You got your farmer's markets are open. Go and grab a cucumber. Just bite it. All right, anyway. Um, <laughs> appreciate your blessings. Be grateful. God still has you here for a purpose. Okay. Have lunch with a friend. You know, maybe even in your field. Have lunch. I'm going to do that today. Matter of fact, I got to get myself together. I'm going to meet her at noontime. Go watch a good movie or a limited series and just let your mind go. Sometimes self-care is just listening to your favorite song on repeat. <laughs> just let it play. If it's ministering to you, let it play. <laughs> okay? I hope you got something from this. We really have to pay attention to what our bodies are talking to us about. You know, our bodies is a temple of God. We host the spirit of God in this body. And if we're going to do the work that God has called us to do, we have got to be healthy. How are we going to help somebody else if we're not healthy? Duh. <laughs> okay. So thank you for joining me for Sharvisations. And I will be on at 11 o'clock next Saturday. God bless.